to the Nook on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm Steve. I'm here today with Britt and Kev G. Kev G, Mike, Yo, and John. John. I don't know why I always have problems with people's names. On here. <laughs> I have problems with people's names anyway. But right. Blame it on the cigar. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I don't do. With yeah. your own name, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is... Slim Shady. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> start to the start to the mess. Starts with the mess. <laughs> so, Mike, what are you drinking today? Um, it's a little gem, uh, Nikazi Brewing Company yeah. from uh, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, vanilla Otis. It's an nice. oatmeal stout with vanilla. Uh, I'm a big fan of an oatmeal stout. Any day of the week, can give me an oatmeal stout and be like, "Thank you for breakfast," and that would be <laughs> like a large part of my uh, my calories for the day. Uh, but yeah, so this is uh, Nikazi. It's got vanilla in it, and it's wonderful, and I can't say a damn thing about it. That's yeah. such a cool name. <laughs> Every once in a while, Nikazi makes its uh, presence again here on Wednesday night. Yeah. And uh, I always think Or whatever that, night we, yeah, we do these. Yeah, that's a cool night. Not right? necessarily cool that name. we film it on Wednesday or Tuesday or any other day of the week. You know, what it, you know what it means? It wasn't... No, it's, I, I, you said it last time. It's but Sumerian. I'm, that's what really? I, yeah, I was yeah, thinking alien, was a but yeah. Sumerian god of beer. Goddess. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense now. When I was thinking of a name for my brewery, I thought of, I, I found Ninkasi, and I was like, oh, wait, there's already one that. Okay. <laughs> Damn. So, <laughs> hops? I wonder what they made it with back then. What did they they didn't, I don't think they used hops. No. Uh, they used Sweet. other things, though. Well, they still use barley, I think. Oh, yeah. But they didn't use hops. Well, hops was a later addition. They used other kind of herbs and stuff to bitter it. Theory goes is that beer was, well, they left the barley out to dry, and it got wet, and they dried it up in a basket, and they noticed it was bubbling, and they're like, well, what the hell is this about? And they're like, oh, this tastes different. Well, let's see what we can do with this different taste, and there you go, beer. Well, that's... But they think might Yeah, exactly. Happen. So the theory goes. Like, you know, who knows? Could have been aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have my hair done right. Could have been aliens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it's aliens. I'm not saying it's aliens. It's aliens. What it's is aliens. aliens? <laughs> the original, uh, what was the Nectar of the Gods? Ambrosia. Ambrosia, yes. The Probably made with Ambrosia. tangerines and, and marshmallows, which is amazing, by the way. Yeah, it, yeah, that's not a drink, though. That's not a drink. <laughs> Why not? No, it was, it was the gods had ambrosia and nectar. The drink was nectar, the food was ambrosia. So, mm. very high blood sugar, tangerines and marshmallows. <laughs> 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 so, anyway. <Sorry>. Right. <laughs> Topic we Moving have on. one. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do actually have one this week. Some weeks we don't. This week we do. Until we do. <laughs> Until we do right? oh. You have no idea how much we wing this before this camera comes on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That being said. Sometimes we actually research the topic and, and all that. It's happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's happened. <laughs> so, the narrative. The narrative of what? the media, right? What, what the, does... The power of narratives and uh, how the media and the lone wolf. And education... Uh, feeds into it. The lone wolf go gunman, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah, th it's just the power of the narrative and how, and how it's uh, fostered by um, media, education, government, and uh, people's, uh, I guess, uh, just the power of numbers um, just feeding into narratives that typically are false. Well, so what do you mean power of numbers? Uh, w when just perception is reality and when you have a lot of people um, perceiving an event or a person a certain way. Or their perception steered to right. a consensus. Or, or their perception is steered, right. You, you, you just have that, um, you just have a whole group of people, the, the uh, help me out here, I'm just. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they're, they're, um, well, it kind of increases have, the chances that some topic's gonna be talked about around People in groups. Yeah, yeah, you have uh, just the, that swarm that um, you can't really get the truth out because you're you're you trying to say, that, hey, that this, you know, we, we've been, you know, misled here, but uh, 
kind of get drowned out just with all the noise. Well, I'll use a political example just because it's super easy. Um, all right, so I'm not the biggest fan of Rand Paul myself. I think he's just kind of a schlub. <laughs> uh, anyways, but so the well, narrative. He's a politician. Yeah, so. he's a politician. And yeah. Politics and you know, <laughs> a whole hierarchy thing, government and rules and bullshit. But um, so the narrative is Rand Paul ain't doing good. He may drop out. He's he's not getting a lot of support. That's the narrative. Uh, if you were to look at the poll numbers, whether or not you believe them to be accurate or not, doesn't matter. But the poll numbers will come up as like he's on par, like as of like last month or something, with like Carly Fiorina or something like that, right? So, but the narrative is Rand Paul is doing really bad. Carly Fiorina, up and comer. Yeah, it's it's just simply say uh, all it is is that somebody just says it, yep. and if it's repeated enough, it becomes the line. It becomes the thing that everybody right. else is saying because well, they heard it on CNN in the middle of the night, and you know. You know. What are you talking about, Mike? The media just reports the facts. Of <laughs> they just report the facts objectively. Objectively, objectively yeah. yeah, it's never subjective. But they and, choose the facts. Yeah. <laughs> Selectively chosen facts, or they make them up. Like, what was the most recent one? Like, with the hospital, right? Was that... The no-spin zone. Haven't you ever heard that? <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of the no-spin zone? Bill Riley would never say anything that isn't, you know, not completely <laughs> honest. Uh, okay, yeah, so, the, so the hospital and, and ISIS, which that's a whole show on its own. Future show, go. ISIS. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so there was a, a, a hospital in Syria that was bombed. Afghanistan? Y- Syria. I think. Was it, no, it was Afghanistan. You're right. Thank you. That's right. All right. There's, I'm sorry. There's too many wars going on right Changing now. Changing the narrative. It's hard too, to remember. Too many hospitals getting bombed. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's the other, yeah too many hospitals being bombed. Uh, this One planet. is too many. Oh, this planet. All right. Anyway, so, um, so it was a hospital sorry. bombed in Afghanistan. And the, I don't know, the U.S., well, they thought it was like ISIS was in there or some bullshit. I don't know. Anyway, so... Um, the narrative at the very beginning was U.S. bombs hospital, okay? And then it became, hot, no joke, New York Times, hospital exploded, same time U.S. bombing. <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> like, no, seriously. I didn't see that yeah, one. No, 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 no seriously. That, that was like the next, like after a couple days, the narrative had changed was hospital exploded, during U.S. bombing. Hospital oh, was U.S. bomb. Well, well, the thing I find interesting about this case, though, is that normally they're like, oh, well, they were storing weapons there, or there was a terrorist there, so that justifies us killing a whole bunch of innocent people. They're not even saying that this time. They're just giving a whole bunch of different ideas and hoping one of them will stick. Yeah. 1943. V-2 rockets flew over London. Same time, London train tunnel collapses. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's on the same par as that. Like, it's that yeah. ridiculous if you really objectively think about it. Like, what are they saying here, you know? So, uh, I think, I think one thing I think is important to bring up is that every, or most of the news outlets in existence today are all owned by like three people. Yeah. And five corporations, something like that. And yeah. most of their news comes from a single. Source the AP, mm-hmm. so yeah, essentially. Oh, well, Reuters too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there's there's there. there's a couple different. So you've got like your AP, you've got Reuters, and then another one, another one, another one. It'll come to me maybe, but I know I'm going to use the example of a newspaper, and like, nobody even reads a newspaper. I got that. I understand, <laughs> but it shows. But it shows a, a good point is that if you were to pick up, um, let's say. The Union Tribune in San Diego. Not saying that we're in anywhere near San Diego, but let's say we were. So if you pick up the Union Tribune, if you look at the front page of the newspaper, almost every single column on there says, you know, author of the column, AP Newswire. The whole fucking front page. So if it's AP Newswire and that's a major newspaper and all the other newspapers are doing the same thing, it's the exact same story. They're just, it's just being parroted. You might have, like, one column where it's all, like, staff writer, and you're like, oh, super, like, somebody actually wrote this thing, you know? Uh, they have computer algorithms that write stories, specifically <laughs> business section. 
is um, is just well, done by computers oh, yeah. because it's that's... like just numbers and facts and stuff. So if you ever see a weird misprint, it's probably not a misprint. That's what the algorithm said, what the word was, and they just printed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to know how crazy it gets, that's wow. that's the end of it somewhere. Yeah. Oh, pretty nuts. I think I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, I want to uh, go with what you were saying earlier that uh, th they're just throwing all these stories out there and, and trying to see one that sticks. And uh, I mean that that's that's when, when it shows how you know weak their uh, position is trying to do that. But that really is their strategy. Is is um, they know how powerful uh, the narrative can be, so that you know they they're, they're just keep making those attempts. If one you know is fizzles out, you know, they'll just go for the next one. Well, and one of the I've things, too, that's interesting about that, I'm, I'm sorry, um, one of the interesting things about that, too, is that depending on what your uh, particular bias is might depend on which story you believe, too. So they throw out a whole bunch of different stories, essentially from the same source, um, or, or different explanations of a story so that you grab everyone across the nation. So you talk to one person and they believe this one story because that's what they read and that's what their, their bias led them to believe. Uh, and then you talk to somebody else and they believe something different about essentially the same story and essentially leads them to a similar conclusion, but because of their bias, they tend to believe this this other story. So it's sometimes not so much just trying to get something to stick, but they're trying to appeal to a, broad, a broader variety of biases. Yeah, I think you've got uh, media selection there. Um, if you have liberals who are going to choose a liberal news outlet, a conservative is going to go for a conservative outlet. You know, I've... Uh, get my news from various libertarian and anarchist outlets. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I mean, I, I check the other ones too because I, I, I want to see what where the other... Um, How the narrative is being formed. To, right, yeah. To yeah. influence the, the, the major collective, the 50%, the yeah, dead vote or whatever. Right. So let me ask you this. How do you avoid creating the narrative? What are, what's the, what are some... Things. I always like well, you always <laughs> have, uh, shoot straight for a solution, right? Yeah. You know, like, I like, well, I, like I, I think I think a better question is: Do uh, is is creating a narrative necessarily bad? Hmm. Is I I don't I don't know that you can get away with creating a narrative. It's part of the yeah. It's um, objective. As long not, as long as your narrative is yeah objective. Right. You can. What the truth is is that yeah. no one is, is that creative. There is no such thing as objectivity. Right. 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 No, so, that's true. And that's why no, I, I, would, I would advocate right that that uh, future ethics, you know, would evolve. Where let's just say a newspaper is written and the author uh, signs a John Chandler anarchist, you know, the voluntarist, you know, what yeah. I mean? so uh, in full disclosure, that author is saying. You know, this is what I believe, and this is the lens in which I through which I see the world, and then that becomes the norm, and you, it's out in the open, right? And so, like, uh, example, we could go to antiwar.com and get some really good stories, but you know the source you're getting it from. They're anti-war. There's nothing wrong with right. that, right? You know, it's not it's, it's, in the it's not objective, right? Yeah. But you know what you're getting. It, the problem is you've got uh, the the alphabet soup on television, and and the the corresponding uh, rags out of the, the, the numerous cities and they parade you know as objective mm, right yeah. and that's the problem I see it is you can't really get rid of you know subjectivity well let's say that uh, news outlets were more objective and transparent isn't the choice of news of what's being reported on still a narrative how do you Say that again. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I think I know what you're saying. So the fact that they're reporting one, on one story rather than another is itself building a narrative. Yeah, what, what are they leaving out? Yeah, like, so like, like the fact that like they, they talk, they, you see one story after another, terrorist this and terrorist that. Hey, I got uh, and And that's all you see in the news. You're going to think that terrorism is a huge issue when, in fact, you are magnitudes 
times yeah. more likely to be killed by a cop yeah. in this nation right. than or in this geopolitical it, location I, I than, would go like, yeah, 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 than a like, terrorist. The general narrative is anything and everything that poisons the worldview of humans, right? So uh, humans hmm. are destroying the planet. They need to be regulated. Humans can't be trusted. They need to be policed. Humans can't be, you know, it's everything gives. The only thing that a person can come with by watching the media is that humans are the problem. We aren't the solution. When in reality, we can create the world. Uh -huh. That is, you know, beautiful. Yeah, you, you mentioned that earlier, and that kind of that kind of gets me thinking about. Um, okay, so narrative is global warming. Everybody gonna die. We gotta regulate this, this, and that, and we're all under. We all have to be under control of something. Okay, so I was. That's a, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. So. So. Real quick, like, because it's not like a big point. It's more of, more of a thought to ponder. So, all right, the the how many times can I say so in an episode? And <laughs> somebody's gonna correct me on that and be like, you gotta knock that stuff. About fifteen more 15? minutes. Fourteen more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, mm, put a counter at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna say it. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, the uh, narrative is. Humanity, horrible, regulate, gl global warming, climate change, <laughs> yep. that sort of a thing. But why not, instead of saying, oh, we have to regulate everything because we're destroying the planet, why not say, okay, there's a lot of people on here, we're having a big impact on the natural resources, why isn't the narrative... Let's get off the planet. Let's go colonize Mars. Let's go colonize the moon. <laughs> why isn't that a narrative? Because it's not about... It's not about... Uh, controlling the resources or making sure the planet is healthy is about controlling us. That's what it's about. Right. And, and you know, whatever narrative they can it's, come up with, whether it be accurate or not, is they're going to use that narrative to control people. Yeah. So yeah. humans I, will I enslave themselves. So, can, the global yeah. warming is a, a good one. That's a good example because that's a very powerful and incredibly dangerous narrative mm -hmm. that a lot of people are just they they believe it so blindly. Um, yeah, that's that's just a good example of. of and what we're talking about, the power of narratives. I, uh, well, I was going to get what, what you made me think of. Yes. So, so part, Damn of, it. <laughs> part of building a narrative, part of building a narrative is building the options, or is, is creating a f false dichotomies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had this problem, so we can either do this or we can do this. And there are no other and options. And there's no other options. Yeah. There's never a plan that's, C. That's what I love. Like you the, can vote for a Republican or a Democrat. That's what I loved about like watching Snowden and WikiLeaks, more so WikiLeaks. Uh, and there's been a couple of others that have been outside of the the paradigm. Sort of like uh, Vice, Vice, like investigative journalism that comes from Vice. I think a lot of those. Uh, uh, yeah, I was so what I was talking about was like to like after the WikiLeaks exploded on the scene, there was this quiet time that the left and the right <laughs> was like. Formulating their battle plan. <laughs> you know right. I mean? how, how, right. how are we going to treat this one? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, like how? Yeah. They just put the raw. Right, right. Out. So yeah, there's yeah. like this couple of weeks. You know, they're like, oh wow, it's remarkably quiet. The funniest you know, like, thing is, that anything, there right? was actually a group in the Department of Defense which created a report on how to take down WikiLeaks, which was then leaked by WikiLeaks. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Beautiful. That's how you do it, right there. But that was your point, John. That there's a different type of news that's more about just giving information and then people decide how to interpret no, it? No, I think that, I, I honestly, I think most of it's all charades and canned anyway, but there are some unplanned, unforeseen events that come about, and I think maybe WikiLeaks could have been something like that. And uh, uh, there's this period that the orchestrators have to kind of figure out how they're going to incorporate this into the new narrative. You know what I mean, right? right. So it's like, uh, and I think that's a, a you know, WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden both. Uh, there was kind of that vacuum where they didn't have uh, a narrative, you know, ready or right, crafted right. Uh -huh. uh, enough. So you have alternative media um, creating narrative, well, building their own narratives. Not that narratives are bad. We don't, I don't think we need to um, stop creating narratives. Right. I think uh, it's it's just storytelling is the part of how humans understand the world we live in. So, um, but yeah, alternative media, they created uh, their their stories and uh, those became more popular narratives 
than what the government and the media uh, eventually fed to us. Right. It was uh, interesting you brought up uh, Snowden because it took them a good like three or four weeks to start calling him a traitor. You know, right. like because they didn't know, like <laughs> yeah, they didn't right, know right, how right, to like because right. you see if they if the story came out and they said traitor, everybody would be like fascist. But they had to like you know sneak it in there as like oh okay well we, what did he do with this information? Where's he going? And the minute he went to Russia, they're like traitor, traitor. Yeah. Remember the Cold War, huh? Yeah. Commies, right? Traitor. <laughs> you know, so yeah, He's that been was with, for Russia this whole time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was the other thing. Oh, part. he was working for Russia the whole yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. Well, what's great about that too is Russia is like we don't we're not dealing with them at all. We're not even we're not even talking to them. Yeah. <laughs> and so they had to adjust to that. But there's I I still talk to people who are like, oh yeah, he was a traitor. He he gave information to our enemies. Like no, he gave information to us. So if you he he gave it to you know people. He put it out for everybody. So, if the by the government calling him a traitor, that's saying that we are the enemies, which I thought was a good way of twisting that yeah. around. And it does show a little bit of a twisting the narrative, <laughs> it shows turning the narrative against him. It shows a little bit of a change in uh, in in culture too. Um, some, somebody will say it if I mention it, and I can't remember the guy's name. And, uh, Terrible, but uh, Pentagon Papers. Um, Ellsberg. 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 Danny Ellsberg. Yep. Thank you. Um, Danny. Yeah. Sounds like he's your friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, Danny Ellsberg. Yeah. Because I met the guy, right? No. Um, that was. Um, we had lunch last week. Yeah. <laughs> so you're a traitor too. Call him Danny. Huh? He's your buddy. Huh? Straight my tie. Um, you know, I mean, when that came out, I mean, talk about a difference in culture. Your general person you talked to on the street thought he was a damn hero, mm -hmm. and Edward Snow came out, and it's like more or less you still talk to people like, oh, he's a traitor, and you're like, whoa, like, so he told you that you're the whole government, or not the whole government, but a, you know a very large chunk of the government's uh, enforcement ability or whatever you talk about is just finer than your average Joe who's going to buy well a six pack of whatever, you know is. is what is he doing on Facebook? That's being recorded. What is he doing here? What is he buying? That's being recorded. It's all being put into a giant server in the middle of Utah. Like, and traitor? Really? You know, like that. Talk. You talk about how like the narrative is being formed. Like, whoa. Okay. So let's, let's go a little bit more recent. There's okay. a war on cops. There. Oh yeah. There's a war on cops. Uh, be, because why? Cops, like the police have become more militarized. Mm -hmm. The cops are killing more people. They are assaulting more people. They're killing dog other pe they're killing people's dogs. You know at, at the drop of a hat, really, a, when yeah. it comes to, yeah. Are they really killing more people or is it just being seen more now with the with the GoPro cams? Yeah, look like, at the statistics. Yeah, they're killing more people. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a forty year yeah. high this uh, this last year. Over the last year there's a forty year high for cops killing people. Um, cop, cop deaths, forty year low. But there's a war on <laughs> cops. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, cops uh, solve homicides at about a 60% rate now. Uh, it used to be 90%. Don't uh, say that uh, out loud. People get scared. <laughs> 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 uh, but I'm, I'm just thinking, like, you know, if that's one of their, their duties. And ten, ten year backlog a, a murder has two cases. and five chance to get away with murder. I mean, that's, you know, but. Uh, I'm surprised it was 90. <laughs> Well, that, that, yeah, that was a uh, good 40, 50 years ago is all I got. But, uh... Yeah, 60 sounds high. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, 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 all about, it's all about spinning the, the information to get... To, to tell people what they, you want them to hear and yes. what you want them to believe. Do you think this is a conscious effort or more of just a human tendency to... No, I think it's a conscious effort. You can yeah. actually you can cite references too. I mean, like uh, there's Norman really Dodd. Good... Norman Dodd interview. Uh, yeah, he speaks about. He was uh, the chairman of the Reese Commission. I think it was, which was an investigation into uh, nonprofit organizations and communism back 1953-54. But he was, uh, you know, a financial wizard before the uh, 
the Great Depression, and he was brought on to investigate why, and he, he said basically unsound baking practices, and uh, ultimately in his investigation, he uncovered how it goes back to J.P. Morgan and a bunch of others buying the 25, talk, talk about this, a narrative, buying the top 25 papers in the country back in like 1908, 1910, somewhere around there, with the intent to uh, steer the perception of the public uh, in a more, with a more favorable light towards war and through foreign interventions. Wow. Because they, yeah. they, had, they deemed that the most, uh, the easiest way to steer a, a society in the direction you want to is through war. But they have to change the perception of war. And it, it actually, it goes deeper, it goes to the American Historical Society, which then was Mary, and I can't remember his name, but Bird was a husband and wife team, and they were the, the top dogs in the American Historical Society. And Morgan and company approached them and said, would you uh, consider uh, uh, writing history, American history, in a more favorable light to foreign in interventionism to build this, this great society that they were painting as what the future would look like? And the Bird said flatly, no. And ultimately what they did is they went and found 17 scholars and funded their Oxford education. And those 17 people would go on to be, come the American Historical Society. Oh, wow. so, so, so American history has been corrupted back around 1918, 1920. That's by the time those guys got in, you know. So uh, they're, they're, the point being is that there was intent to color the way American history is taught in school to give the students a more favorable view towards foreign interventions and war for the purpose of building a great society. Ultimately, what, you know, to carry it forward to the LBJ, the great society. You know, this is all born from that line of thinking, anyway. But yeah, it's a Norman Dodd. It's a great interview if you want to check that out. And I don't so know. That's, that's where it, uh, you know, they, they use the, the power of the media. They use uh, the power of academia and, and education to uh, you know, force these narratives that, that don't serve us. Right. So, yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the show Bullshit, Penn & Teller's Bullshit. Yep. Great show. It's, it's no longer on the air, but it was a great show. A um, couple of the episodes were not great, but most of them were really great. And he did an episode one time on statistics. And he had this guy on, I forget his name now, uh, but he's still doing statistics. And he said straight out, on on camera that what he'll do is the network will tell him how he want how they want the statistics to turn out oh, it's frank and that Luntz. frank Luntz, right frank yeah. yes frank yeah. Luntz. Yeah. got to meet that guy really oh, yeah nice. <laughs> these guys got a really slimy hand <laughs> <laughs> fitting fitting but, right. but he he would take however he wanted the statistics to turn out that's how he would frame the question and they even did on, on the on the episode that they did, they took a, a given question and he asked people two questions back to back, which essentially asked the same question and got two completely different answers. Hmm. Just yeah. on how he worded the questions. And he asked them back to back. How did he yeah. admit that though? And how's that, how's that not more of a scandal? <laughs> <laughs> like he's, being, he's saying that I've manipulated yeah, he's, the he's system. He's still on Fox yeah. News to this day. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. <laughs> Like you, like I was just thinking maybe an example of, of how you could skew an answer. Okay, you can ask the question, is the sky blue? Right? Easy answer. So. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Um, alternative, you could, an you could ask the question, is the sky a different color than blue? Could it be that you might get a couple people like, well, okay, it's 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 a turquoise. It's a little bit more of a, you know, kind of more of a cyan. You know, like you see what I'm saying? Like you just, just rewording things a little bit can kind of, you know, get a different reaction out. And of then people. if you asked a robot, and if you asked <laughs> a robot, well, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. We were just talking about it earlier how this there's a new AI system. That, that, that they said had an IQ of about a four-year-old. So, if you say... Wait till it turns 18. <laughs> 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 Terrible! Uh, if, um, okay, so if you... Alright, so if you had a robot that was an android that could, you know, necessarily... And it was only four? 
Would you have to wait for the robot to turn 18 or get, like right off the assembly line? This is <laughs> really bad. Well, you know, you want you want uh, guys, yeah. uh, we're out of time. <laughs> Amazing uh, ending next week. <laughs> have a good one. <laughs>